in the post-colonial period, in the immediate sort of post-independence period, most governments in Africa considered higher education is extremely important and most of the universities that we have today, the leading universities, were uh, built or expanded in the, in the 60s. And, and the university was a symbol of national pride. And, and by the 80s, however, there was a, a dramatic shift away from supporting universities. They saw universities as troublemakers or uh, you know, as, as centers of uh, opposition to them. And with the growing militarization, there was more repression. And, and, and so, in a sense, 20 years, 20, 30 years was lost. And I've never myself, myself understood how anybody would imagine that Africa would catch up without higher education. Well, the numbers are good. I think the fastest growing university population in the world is Africa. Uh, but we still have a long way to go compared say, to Asian countries. Unfortunately, one of the effects of the 30 years of neglect of the African universities is that there are huge shortages of teaching staff. And even those who are teaching within African universities are overburdened by uh, you know, large classes. And sometimes their survival strategies involve doing consultancies that undermine their research work. And so I think one of the most important things we can do for African universities to help African universities is to support the staff. We can do that by providing spaces for them to do sabbatical or to interact with their colleagues abroad, to, um, to be able to come here to LSE, spend two, three months and you know, retool and discuss with colleagues here about what's going on in their fields and so forth. Well, the African Initiative is, is a multifaceted um, program at LSE to, in a sense, to bring, to give life to African studies and, and, and Africa's contact, and Africa's presence at the LEC. And that it does in, you know, in, in, through several initiatives, which include fellowships to bring Africans here, the chair itself, of course, as, a, as one example, the coordination of um, um, the Africanists within LEC, and um, attempts to raise funds to bring uh, African leaders and African scholars and African professionals to LAC. It's in the interest of those who study Africa here that is a vibrant African social science research community uh, because in a sense uh, we who are working here we can only go for short visits and come back uh, but you need a permanent presence and the, that is provided by local scholars. Uh, some of the programs that we've, we've been thinking about uh, especially on and sort of supporting faculty uh, UCT does a lot of that already in terms of uh, producing PhDs. A number of African countries now are relying on actually uh, universities in South Africa for, their, for producing their teaching staff. Also UCT can be, and it's been used by some of the scholars here, as an entry point to the larger African story. It should facilitate the work of uh, LAC scholars here to have a partner like UCT in Africa. But we think also other bigger programs which may not directly involve UCT at the beginning. But, uh, one of them is the African Leadership Program. Uh, offering uh, um, African leaders from government, from NGO, from you know private sector, the opportunity to sit down for two, three weeks, uh, talk and listen to discussions and presentations on a whole range of issues that one hopes any African leader playing on the global stage is made familiar with. Well, I've been interested uh, first just the whole idea of. D development, that is, uh, how do societies develop in general? And I suppose as an African, I had no choice that's to have that as a major preoccupation. And in the 80s and 90s, uh, we, had, we were faced with a, an economic thinking that I think set aside development and was focused on, on stabilization, debt repayment issues, and all that. And, and I think a whole generation of African, young Africans were, you know, directed towards that focus on stabilization, macroeconomic, and very little about the major issues of development, structural changes, income distribution, and managing conflicts of, 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 of transformation and so forth. And I, I, I think there's a change now, there's a, a, a return, if you like, to uh, the focus by economists on the developmental problems, which are, which are not a simple resource allocation. They're much more complex than that. Mm -hmm.
we have to bear in mind that um, we are coming from a period when people thought of Africa as only in negative terms. That is, uh, a lot of writing on Africa, a whole range of studies, were trying to explain what was called the African tragedy, if you like, and which was the inability of African economies to perform well. Uh, that was a misleading story because if you look at Africa's growth uh, performance since independence, if you were to draw the curve, it would look like an N, you know. It goes up from 60 to 80s and then it goes down the 80s and goes up again. So uh, the main headache now is make sure it doesn't turn into an M-shaped curve, which goes down again. But I think you will see very rapid growth. It will be sustained, I think. I think there's, there's uh, the political pressures in Africa for improving uh, the well-being of, of, uh, of, of the population of the African people is, is very high. And I think we do have a resource space that's good. Uh, Africa is young, it's a very young population, and um, if we can Im improve our investments in you know, human resources, and if we can continue improving the governance structures in Africa, um, uh, we should be able to sustain very high levels of growth. I, mean, um, I, I see no reason why Africa shouldn't do that.